Every year, the Birdman Rally brings that magic moment to Japan where teams make their own innovative gliders and compete for the longest glide. But gliding still isn't enough. We continue to be obsessed with muscle-powered flight. About 20 years ago, Paul McCready designed a human-powered plane, the Gossamer Albatross. Powered only by the pilots pedaling, the Albatross flew 22 miles across the English Channel. Well, everybody somehow wishes they could do human-powered flight. It's an instinct that maybe all humans share one way or another. The energy needed to drive the propeller and move the albatross forward was almost more than the pilot could manage. And despite his physical conditioning, he barely made it. The problem is, humans just aren't strong enough. But when you look at all the numbers, it turns out that to have a plane that is safe enough, st stable, uh, structurally sound enough to hold a person, uh, keep a person aloft, be able to climb a bit, it takes about a minimum of three horsepower, and that's a factor of 10 more than a person can put out. So we've come to rely on machines to give us the power to thrust ourselves forward. The rubber band on a toy plane acts as an engine does, providing the energy to move the propellers. Propellers are like a spinning wing. Like a wing, they produce lift, but in a forward direction. Propellers are airfoils. When they bite into the air and it creates lift and it creates thrust just by the movement going through the air. It's just a big windmill, basically. So now if we take a piece of air here and we push it aft, it takes a force to do that. And that's the force that's thrust. Propellers and piston engines have been pushing and pulling planes across the sky for 90 years. Where I can remember one day looking up and no, the, probably the same airplane route that a propeller plane was on was now a jet. And that was captivating. That as a child I was watching technology change in front of my eyes. So to fly higher and faster, we stopped soaring like the swallows and started squirting like the squid. Creatures like octopus, squid, and jellyfish all work on the same principle as a jet engine. Action and reaction. So the fuel goes into the engine. It's converted into work by speeding up the air, increasing its energy as it goes out the back. And that difference then provides a thrust. John Travolta's Gulfstream II has two Rolls-Royce jet engines, each producing almost 12,000 pounds of thrust. This is an overpowered aircraft. A plane 30,000 pounds heavier than this plane is run by the same engines, the British Aircraft uh, 111, which is an airliner. So you have that level of, uh, of excess of power. I like overpowered airplanes. They thrill me because in an emergency you have more than you need and um, it gives you a sense of, of well-being on a certain level. For some pilots, it's more than a sense of well-being. It's speed is life. The faster that you end up going, it's, there's a lot of things it does for you. One, it gets you through a threat area quicker. And two, it's gonna, it doesn't allow missiles to track you. Roger that. If somebody's shooting at you, you try to go a little bit faster. Uh, or if you're trying to catch somebody, you try to go a little bit faster. An afterburner is simply a way to get uh, a short, da what they call dash speed, so that you can get into or out of trouble uh, just as rapidly as possible. 
Well, an afterburner is, uh, is, is really pretty simple. Uh, it, you take an extra piece of pipe and you put it on the back of the airplane and you dump fuel into it, the fuel ignites and goes zooming out the back. And you get a lot of power for that, but it also costs you a lot of fuel. What you're trying to do is you're getting enough thrust going out the backside that it equals the amount of weight that you're carrying. So that's when you start hearing ratios where you hear a one-to-one -one ratio is what you'd like to have from a fighter. Well, the F-18 has about a 1 to 1.1 1 .1 to 1 thrust to weight ratio. With that much thrust, a pilot can stand on his tail and for a moment forget about gravity. But just for a moment. Well, I mentioned to my parents that, um, that I wanted to fly when I was about 10 or 11 years old, and they said, well, Patty, you know, women, women don't become airline pilots, so you can kind of forget that. I was brought up around it, and I remember um, going out and seeing my dad when I was four or five years old at the airport, and he'd, you know, he'd pull me up into his big airplane and sit me down, and we'd go taxiing around. I always knew that I wanted to fly. I might have 25 maneuvers doing anything from vertical maneuvers where I'd let the plane slide backwards through its smoke, and that always gets a good reaction from the crowd, or maybe a torque roll where the plane is rolling going vertical and then sliding backwards through the smoke going vertical straight down. Um, we like to do tumbling maneuvers where the plane's tumbling end over end, and people think the plane's just totally, and it is out of control, so they're right. National aerobatic champion Patty Wagstaff is anything but out of control. It takes precision and skill to turn cartwheels in the sky. The ability to keep these maneuvers under control is essential to flight. Control surfaces are the movable parts of the wings and tail that allow the pilot to deflect the passing airflow and pivot the plane in the desired direction. There are three axes in an airplane and the three are yaw, which is when the plane goes side to side, and that's controlled by the rudder. Pitch is when the plane goes up and down, and that's controlled by the elevator. And roll is around the longitudinal axis, and that's controlled by the ailerons. When you roll the airplane, you're rolling the airplane around the longitudinal axis. So if you draw, if you take a string and you put it right down the middle of the airplane, and then you move the ailerons, and you move the wing, you're gonna roll the plane around that string. And that's what a roll is. Patty Wagstaff may be on a roll, but most pilots try to avoid that sort of thing. They want stability. Most general aviation planes that people are flying around, the pilots have a lot of stability built into those planes. And they're flying around, and they put the plane into a dive, and they take their hands out, hands off, and the plane will oscillate until it returns back to straight and level. Well, my plane and most aerobatic planes are not designed for that. So if I take my hands off the controls, the plane will probably go off into a roll, go into a dive, and stay there. It's not going to want to come out. And that's really good for aerobatics. The connections between the pilot and the control surfaces in most small planes, even aerobatic ones, is mechanical. Cables, pulleys, and levers do the job. Uh, in a small aerobatic plane like mine, um, it's very, very simple. It's just push-pull tubes and torque tubes. So when I move the stick to the right, I, all I'm doing is pulling the tube over and it's deflecting the ailerons. And the same with the elevator. I'm just pushing and pulling tubes that get connected to the control surfaces. But fighter jets are a different story. The shape of the plane 